Well, welcome, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. The Hebrew word for Sabbath literally means to cease. Just as God rested from his creation work, we are to rest from our day-to-day -day occupations and refocus on what's really important. It's a day to push the reset button. Taking a Sabbath rest is an act of faith. It's a reminder that no matter what we do, God is in control. When I was teaching overseas, I would often, during the vacation time, do a camp. And since I was an elementary school teacher and liked to keep it that way, um, but sometimes I would take on older children. And for a camp that lasted a week, I could, I could deal with the older kids. And normally, if it was um, just an English camp, then most of the kids there uh, really wanted to be there. So one year I did a high school camp and what we talked about were different cultures. So um, I introduced them to various cultures, uh, but what I compared was the Asian culture to the Western culture. And what I asked them to do is think of what's different. What can, so the, the kids started, and most of the Western culture they've been exposed to is like m through the movies and things like that, right? So I had a few kind of to help them out. Um, so some of the easier ones, you know, in, in the West, we shake hands. W what do they do in, in the Asian culture? Bow. Yeah, they bow, right? Um, in the West, we use something called a chair toilet. M maybe you didn't even know that there's a name for it, because for us, it's just a toilet, right? But in the Asian culture, they have a different kind of, this, this is called a squatting toilet. And uh, you can only imagine my horror when I first saw this. Uh, I don't know if you could see, you know, you have to squat. Anyway, uh, I never uh, had to use one, uh, but it's just a cultural difference, right? So this is a breakfast for us, right? But in Korea, their breakfast typically included uh, rice, uh, an egg, or a piece of meat. Always kimchi. This is Korea we're talking here. Three, three meals a day includes rice and kimchi. We use a knife and fork in Asia. Yeah, obviously. Anybody here have good chopstick skills? Yeah, it's pretty handy. In fact, I don't know if I told you this, but... Uh, According to Korean uh, lore, chopsticks are actually better because this is, you're stabbing your food. But if you use chopsticks, you're picking it up gently. It's a more civilized way to eat food. So anyway, I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, here in the West, we wear our shoes everywhere, right? But in Asia, uh, when you go into uh, uh, someone's home, you, you take your shoes off. And I, I've been to the Kinjo residence and they have a spectacular shoe shelf that has everything there. And, and most Asian families do have a, a pretty nice shoe rack. Um, so when I went to Korea, this was my mantra. This is what I heard when I was in college. Um, it's a little poem by Robert Ellis and it says, if you can't fight, and you can't flee, flow. And that was my mindset when I was going to go to Korea. It was going to be different, right? And, and I wasn't going to fight an entire nation because they do things different from me. I wasn't going to run away because I had gone on a flight from Portland all the way to Korea. I was going to flow. I was just going to endure whatever their culture threw my way. And I lasted uh, 11 years, so I think I did a pretty good job of flowing. But what I'd like to talk about today is the Christian culture and what that entails. So before I begin, let's have a uh, word of prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to be with us. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this wonderful Sabbath day that everyone uh, who, who chose this morning to come down here will receive a blessing. Please send your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds to, to your word. Please use me uh, to, to spread this message 
uh, today. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, uh, culture, according to the dictionary, says a, a customary belief, social forms, and material traits of a racial, religious, or social group. Also, and I highlight it here, the characteristic feature of everyday existence, which basically means your way of life. So uh, your culture is how you live day by day. It's your way of life. Now, for Jesus, when he was being pressed during uh, his time when he was under trial, they asked him, are, are you king? Are you the king of the Jews? And what did he say to them? He said, my kingdom is not of this world. Christ gave an account of the nature of his kingdom. Its nature is not worldly. It is a kingdom within men and women set up in their hearts and conscience. Its riches spiritual, its power spiritual, and its glory within. It's a kingdom open to all. So what Jesus said is, my kingdom is not of this world. He is encouraging us what? Look up. Look up. That's where, uh, where God's physical uh, kingdom is. That's where he wants us to look up. He wants us to not be um, focused on what's here on earth, but to look up. In 1 Peter 2.9, it says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So here is the kind of the nature of Christ's culture, right? It is a spiritual people that he's calling up, right? It is a nation. It's a peculiar. What does peculiar mean? Different. Strange. I prefer different, but if you want to use strange, you can use strange. We are different from what? From the world. From the rest of the cultures. Our culture as Christians is different. Right? And, it's, and it says we show forth the praises. So our life shows who we worship, who we love, who, what we are about. And this, of course, is all humanity. Romans 5.8 said, God commanded his love toward us. Who's us? Everybody. This is a kingdom for everybody. Everybody can, can be a part of this culture of Christ. He commended his love toward us and that we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. What happened at the cross was not for a few. It was for everybody in the whole world. Every uh, person. All humanity. And we are a unity of believers. The council uh, to the church says, The life of Christ established a religion in which there is no caste. A religion by which Jew and Gentile, free and bond, are linked in a common brotherhood, equal before God. That is important. We are linked in our love of Jesus Christ. And we are equal before God. Everybody is valuable. Each soul is valuable to God. Men, women. He passed no human being by as worthless, but sought to apply the healing remedy to every soul. The secret of unity is found in the equality of believers in Christ. What unites us is our love of Jesus Christ. To enter the family of Christ, it's an easy thing to do. Give your heart to Christ. But it's easier said than done, isn't it? So, when we give our heart to Christ, when we are this unity of believers... What do we represent? What, what is our attributes? Um, you know, how are we united? We're born again. We're Bible believing. We're fundamentalists. We're faithful. We're reverent. 
We're obedient. We're humble. We're loving. Why are we this way? Because that's how Jesus is. We are that way because Jesus was that way first. He showed us, right? Because Jesus is our standard. Amen. Jesus showed us the way and we follow him. This culture of Christ, he is the standard of the way we are to be. This is a quote uh, about uh, Jesus. It says, character is supreme in life. Is that true? Absolutely. Character, your character is the, is the one thing that in this life that you, you have to protect, that you have to develop. Character is supreme in life, hence Jesus stood supreme in the supreme thing. So supreme that when we think of the ideal, we do not add virtue to virtue, but think of Jesus Christ. So that the standard of human life is no longer a code, but a character. We don't need to, to think about things that are good and, and, and make a long list. We just need to look at Christ. Open up our Bible and learn of Him. Look at His life. Philippians 1.21 To live is Christ, and to die is gain. Death is a great loss to carnal, worldly man. For he loses all his earthly comforts and his hopes. But to a true believer it is gain, for it is the end of all the weakness and misery. It delivers him from all the evils of life and brings him to possess the wonders of God. People do, who do not have Christ, this is all they have, this life on earth. But we know that when we have Christ, we have what? Life eternal. Right now is just our time on earth to live for God. And ultimately when we do that, He has something greater for us. This was one of my conversion quotes, this is our verses. This is something that I read when I was still a seeker that really touched my heart. It's Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Remember, the kingdom of God is not on this earth, but it is within us. Right? It's not a physical kingdom, but it is within every believer and the most powerful thing inside here, not I, but Christ. It's not you. It's, it's Christ who leads and directs us. It's Christ who is our pattern. It's Christ who sets up the standard for the way we live our life. And when we look up, God, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This is one of my favorite books. It's called Last Day Events. It's, it's very powerful. I, I, I recommend everybody get a copy. But chapter 4, it says, The life of Christ was a life charged with a divine message of the love of God. And he longed intensely to impart this love to others in rich measure. Compassion beamed from his countenance, and his conduct was characterized by grace Humility, truth, and love. Every member of his church militant must manifest the same qualities if he would join the church triumphant. These are the things that we are striving for in our life. The character of Christ was represented grace, humility, truth, and love. And those are the things that we have to look in the mirror and say, God, where do I fall short? God, where can I be more humble? Where can I, where am I an heir? It's, it's Christ who we look to as our example. Like I said before, He is our standard. Amen. 
And the standard is found in the Word of God. We are called the people of the book. This book, in Revelation, it talks about two witnesses. What are those witnesses of God? The Old and New Testament. Within these pages, you will find Christ. And He's from Genesis to Revelation. It's important for us to spend more time in the Word than in the world. Psalm 119.11 Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Where must the word of God be? In our hearts. Because our heart is the essence of who we are. It's not the outside. The outside is deceptive. It's your heart. That's who you truly are. The essence of you is in the heart. You know, the very first fundamental belief of our church, right? We have these uh, 27 fundamental beliefs. The number one belief is the belief that the Holy Scriptures, Old and New Testaments, are the written Word of God, given by divine inspiration through holy men of God who spoke and wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It is the Word of God. Um... It is the word God has committed to man, the knowledge necessary for salvation. Where is salvation found? In the word of God. The holy scriptures are the infallible revelation of his will. They are the standard of character, the test of experience, the authoritative revealer of doctrines, and the trustworthy record of God's acts in history. Christian culture is outlined in the word of God. And as we join the family of God, we change, right? The way we act change. The, the, what we love and, and, and everything about us changes. But ultimately, our culture has to change as well. What we do when we come to Christ, it says here we stand firm as a rock to the principles of the Word of God. We have to be principled people. We have to be firm in our beliefs. Those are the principles that we live for. Is that correct? You have to stand for what you know is truth. And truth is only found in here. So when we um, stand for God, when we live by these principles, what we do with the world is we have to draw a line in the sand. We no longer are going to live by the standards of the world. We are no longer going to live by the customs and culture of the, the country that we are from. We're drawing a line in the sand. We now be belong to a Christian culture. A new nation, right? The Bible says that we are a nation of what? Believers. Believers in who? Christ. So we are no longer Americans or, or whatever. We are Christian. All of us. We have a new name, a new title. We are Christian. So there must be a separation. There has to be a separation. This is from the thoughts of the Mount of Blessing. This, to me, is, is, is very powerful. And this is something that you should always... Remember, memorize this. Truth is of God. What is truth of? God. God. Deception. And what's another word for deception? Lies. Lies. Deception in every one of its myriad forms. Myriad is many. So do lies come in different forms? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. This world is full of a myriad of deception. Is of Satan. So we have this separation. Truth is of God, and lies are what? Satan. Of Satan. And Jesus said so. Jesus said that Satan is the father of lies. Truth is of God. Deception in every one of its myriad forms is of Satan. And whoever in any way departs from the straight line of truth, you drew that line in the sand, a straight line, and you're going to stay behind it. That straight line is betraying himself into the power of the wicked one. Now it says here, betraying himself. 
That means that you have personal responsibility, doesn't it? You are responsible for you. You are responsible for the actions that you make. Revelation 18, 4. It says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. God is calling us out of error, calling us out of deception, and pleading with us, Be not partakers of her sins. Because we know that Satan wants to lead us into sin. And if Satan can't lead us directly, he will trick us into sin. But it's important for us to stay focused. Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What is renew? If you renew a library book, it's not to say, it's, it's not get again, it's, it's to, to change, right? It's, it's to make different. The mind that we have before we come to Christ, our minds are going to be changed. It's going to, we're going to renew our mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is a powerful appeal. Go to verse 1. I, I, I put up Romans 12 too, but go, go to Romans. Twelve verse one. It says here in Romans twelve one, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Right? So this appeal we receive from the Lord every day the fruits of his mercy. Let us render ourselves all we are all we have and all we can do to him. And when we do that, we will be changed. We will be changed. In James 4, 4, it says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. What do you think God thinks of the world? Do you think he, he holds it to high esteem? He does not. He wants us not. It says, all sin must be wept over here in godly sorrow or hereafter in eternal misery. Now is our opportunity for change. Now is our opportunity to show God with our lives that we are truly followers of Him. We have to separate ourselves from the world. Matthew 13, 30, let both grow together until the harvest. And in time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. There will be a separation at the end time. God is going to take his people. But do we live together? It says, let them both grow together. We live in this world, ultimately. We are living with people who love God and those who don't. And you know, I have this, um, this pastor a long time ago talked about this. Your life, in essence, is like a ship in the sea. And for all of you who know prophecy, what is a sea in prophecy? It's people, right? So we are a ship in a sea in a world of people, right? But we are above it. We rise above, right? So we are on this sea. And God is saying, as long as you keep the water out of your ship, you will be safe. You will be secure. But what happens when the world starts to come into your ship? What happens? That's right. Is it good for a ship to take on water? No. And what happens if you continue to take on water? You sink into that water. That's not what God wants. God wants us to stay above. We're still on the sea, we're still in the world, but we have risen above. One of my favorite books, 
Creeping Compromise by Joe Cruz. If you've never read it, uh, you should read it. It's a, it's a wonderful book. So I went online and there's a review. Uh, not an Adventist review, but just a review. And the person said, it's from the scrib.com, it says, Beginning with a thorough Bible study on the dangers of the world and the church, Cruz weaves his theme showing how compromise with evil only brings evil. When you compromise with evil, it only brings evil into your life. Elijah in Kings, 1 Kings 18.21, asked the people, how long halt ye between two opinions? You have to remember that we belong, we're involved in the great controversy between good and evil, right? Day by day, this is our struggle. Actually, moment by moment, this is our struggle. Satan does not want to let you go. You're, as long as you have breath in your body, you are involved in the struggle. As long as you have life, as long as you're able to make choices, you are involved in the struggle. And constantly evil will be in your ear, but you know what? Good is in your ear. Amen. And you need to listen to that good. Amen. And once you continue to listen to that good, that evil will, will be quieter and quieter. It'll never go away, but it will be quieter and quieter. And ultimately, you are free to make whatever choice you want, right? One of the greatest gifts of God is free will. You are free to choose. But you are not free from the consequences of your choice, of, of your choices. And this is important to understand that we are free to choose how we want to live our life. We are free to choose, but we are not free from the consequences. And ultimately, we have to understand that the consequence that we're dealing with is salvation. Do we want to live in this world just for this world? Or do we want to live for that kingdom, the heavenly kingdom? Are we going to make des decisions just for this world? Or are we going to make for that after? So what I want to talk about today is other cultures. How many countries are in the world? How many do you think? If you guessed 196, you'd be right. <laughs> there's 196 different countries. So that means there's 196 different cultures. Or more. We belong to the Christian culture. Our culture is found in this book. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to look at some other cultures. And we're going to see what they do. And we're going to see if it holds up to the Bible. Now, I, I, I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to do this. I have a disclaimer. I, if I talk about your culture, you have to understand that I'm not, I'm not talking about people. The Bible says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I am not attacking people. I am attacking, well, I'm not attacking, but I'm bringing to light things that these cultures do against principalities, powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Today, I was challenged with the job of shepherding you. And what I'm trying to do is for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. I am going to just bring information to you. Now, if you have done these things or you're still doing them, I am not your judge. What I want you to do is look to our standard, which is Jesus Christ. Look to the word of God. So when this is over, don't get mad at me. Well, you can get mad at me if you want. We can talk about it, and we can compare what the Word of God says. So, just remember, I, I'm, not, I'm not against people, but I, I am against certain things that, that different cultures do, considering uh, if, if people continue to do them, maybe their salvation will be lost. 
For, with that said, let's talk about a few different cultures. Okay, so I want to start with Polynesia. And if you don't know where Polynesia is, it's go to Hawaii and then it's, it's south down in this area. And in the, in the Polynesian culture, they use tattoos. The Polynesians use this as a sign of character, position, and levels in a hierarchy. Polynesian people believe that a person's mana, their spiritual power or life force, is displayed through their tattoos. So they, they tattoo their bodies. They believe that it, it, it has something to do with their life force, their spiritual force, right? Now, what does the Bible say about tattoos? In Leviticus 19.28, it says, Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks on you. I am the Lord. So what the Bible here is saying that we don't do that. Our culture, our Christian culture, we do not tattoo our bodies. We do not do that. And in fact, if you meet people that have a lot of tattoos, it almost is a form of their religion. It's very spiritual to people when they do that to themselves. Um, what I'd like to share with you, this is a new movie that came out. It's called Moana. And what I want you to look at is this, this big fella right here. What do you notice about this guy? Wow. This guy is, has got a lot of tattoos, right? So I went and I looked at a uh, review of the movie uh, from a Christian standpoint, and it says, Moana treads into some dark, murky waters, which is with its darker themes of magic and mythology. And if you know anything about Disney movies, lots of spirituality, lots of magic, things like that in Disney movies. Um, the film starts out with a voiceover stating, in the beginning there were only oceans, an immediate nod to evolution and false creation. But there's a lot of uh, weird themes throughout it, uh, reincarnation, uh, demons, things like that. But it goes on to say, some parents may be concerned about the multiple characters wearing tattoos all over their bodies. Maui, who is the name of the big fella, brags about how he earns tattoos from doing great job um, deeds. So we have, in the world, is pushing these kind of things on our children, trying to make it acceptable, right? Some people even in our own faith, try to push wearing tattoos as something that God would um, be okay with. And they do this by tattooing Jesus, right? Such blasphemy. And in fact, tattoos are also very expensive. It's not a very good use of our money to, to put these things on, right? And in fact, um, when I was younger, I thought I would get a lot of tattoos, but I was poor, so I didn't. <laughs> and I kind of didn't, didn't like the pain. Um, but it's, 